All right. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to join everybody uh, from Scripps here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm at an Oceanographic Institute. Uh, I, there's this movie called The Life Aquatic, so I've adapted that uh, movie to, um, to my research group here, so hence the life tectonic. So I'm going to try to advance to the next slide here. So what I'm going to try to convince you is that uh, we're going to talk first just about um, general things about the curvature of subduction zones. Uh, we know that island arcs are curved, that's why they're called arcs. And then we'll talk a more about sort of my research interests in, in um, mantle dynamics and, and lithosphere dynamics and how the deep earth connects to uh, tectonics on the surface. And so we'll talk in general terms about how uh, different approaches have been applied to, to understanding uh, plate tectonics in general. And I use this example of where the two plates, a subducting plate, uh, is in contact with an overriding plate where the, the subduction zone itself as the reason or as, as an illustration for um, the essence of how plate tectonics works. Uh, let's see, where are we? Can you see all the points there? I guess they're a little <coughs> low, uh, a little opaque. And then, uh, oh good, we have, so three key results I'll, I'll talk about then is the curvature, um, slab morphology in the upper mantle, and uh, partitioning between uh, subduction motions being either forward plate advance or a sl slab rollback. And then as a model validation, I'm going to uh, use an example of the recent uh, subduction history of the Farallon slab. And so we'll show you some results where we've, we've taken these more generic models and incorporated them into a mantle convection model. And then I'll finally show you, you know, the the real uh, the a real achievement of this line of research, which is uh, just just come out recently in Nature, which is um, forward predicting what the a Yellowstone volcanism, uh, the source of this uh, Columbia River basalt. So this is an an old uh, map of plate boundaries that's from. Um, the early days of plate tectonics and it's immediately apparent that these uh, uh, subduction zones have a curved uh, 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 are, are curved and so there's the Marianas and the Scotia Sea and the Caribbean and this is why it gives them their names the arcs so and up here in the Aleutians and the, the thing that was uh, proposed is there we are that yeah, the, it's, it's due to the actual sphericity of the Earth. And so this is our sort of model ping pong ball and uh, an arc, arcuate shape for a subduction zone and the subducting plate would be going into, into the Earth there. And, and so this overriding plate would, would be above here, um, above the dimple. And so again, looking at the South Scotia Sea, we see this curvature and the back arc spreading center there and the uh, Scotia arc. And it would have some kind of feature that looks like this. So, uh, in maybe one instance, this looks looks to be um, an explanation. And so, there's this little fairy story that was uh, published a long time ago for why these arcs um, might just be related to a dense dense in the earth. Okay. And there's a number of problems with this. Uh, I want to look at this graph that shows the curvature of the arc against the um, the uh, arcuate length okay so there's looking down at our ping pong ball and those those subduction those teeth show the direction of the subduction and so this would take a, a bite out of a, a ping pong ball earth and the uh, these triangles here are from a Tovich and Schubert data set um, which are, try to map what the curvature of the subduction zones are into this, into these two <coughs> parameters, the arc size and the curvature. And so in the ping pong ball analogy would be this line up here. And you see that systematically throughout Earth, if you try to classify these, uh, measure these, they're systematically un under um, estimated by this. The other thing is that this analogy predicts the arc curvature is described by small circles. That's actually 
there's none of these are really well described by small circles. And and this is interesting. The analogy predicts a relationship between the curvature and the dip angle. So, for example, more steeply um, cur uh, slabs, sorry, subduction zones that are more uh, highly curved should have a steeper dip. And some places we actually observe the opposite of that. So that, that trend doesn't tend to hold up. Uh, highly curved arcs, yeah, like Scotia, Hellenic, Mariana, the ones that, that really do express a nice curvature, those, those are all kind of more shallow dipping. So the an analogy also kind of predicts that there's not a lot of lateral variation in the uh, dip angle or the curvature. So they just have this nice smooth surface. And that's uh, not what we see if we look in detail. And then finally, this is really more of a static view of the Earth. And, and it actually turns out that subduction zones are dynamic features and they evolve over time. Um, so this was an early model of uh, Gabriel Amora and he used, if you see these dashed lines down here, this is actually a three-dimensional model uh, similar to the ones that I'll present to you and it actually fits the data um, much better. So I think that sort of relationship compared to this um, is, is really indicating there, that Earth's not working like a ping pong ball. And um, there was a recent study actually that kind of explored the ping pong ball uh, hypothesis a bit more and, and I tried to consider the fluid dynamics of um, or the, really the instabilities of a doubly curved spherical uh, shell and so it looks something like this and, and it can be described with this geometry of uh, curvature in two directions and so this would be the subduction zone and the slab here and um, just uh, develops into some instabilities with a wavelength between these cusps that would depend on um, the material properties of the uh, of the shell itself and so these dimpling instabilities they do exist they work a little bit differently than how they would work on a ping pong ball but it turns out this um, you know the, the physics that's missing in all of this is the interaction between the subducting slab and the underlying mantle and so this is really as far as the, you can take the ping pong analogy before um, facing that you have to involve the mantle at some, at some point. And so I just want to point out um, a couple of clear examples. So this is the Tonga Kermadec Trench and it's actually kind of a nor uh, straight looking arc. It doesn't have a lot of curvature. And then over here um, off the coast of South America you've actually got a lot of uh, curvature in the opposite direction. It's complete, complete um, reverse of what normal um, sort of arc curvature is. So these are uh, clear examples that the, the curvature of arcs is um, controlled by something completely other than just the geometry and um, Earth's sphericity. And just to drive the point home, we see there was now, if you um, remember, I showed you there should be a systematic relationship between the dip angle and the curvature. So if you look at some arc here that has a particular curvature, you actually see a variation in the, in the, the dip angle. And um, same, same with uh, over here and, and over here. So there's a lot of a, lot of a long trench variation in, in every, every type of... Uh, um, in intrinsic parameter that you might want to study. Actually the the global average here, this is work by Wu and Conrad, it's got a radius of curvature so this is kind of if you fit the um, earthquakes in the Wadali Benioff zone you can match the radius curvature. It's about 300 kilometers so it's about one-tenth of the Earth's radii and so this would actually predict a, a very different curvature than what's observed by these island arcs. So what I'm trying to present in terms of observations is that there's a great diversity of subduction zones. And in um, the work I've been doing, we've actually tried to classify them into, uh, into subduction zone systems that uh, the main uh, feature is the width of the subduction zone. And in, uh, now this is reference frame dependent, but in this particular reference frame, I've marked them as which, which subduction zones are retreating. These are the blue ones, so they're actually moving 
in the opposite direction as the plate's um, motion. So in the tonga, it's actually retreating about 16 to 18 centimeters a year in the opposite direction as the uh, Pacific plate. So these are um, larger than most plate motions, and the, these are motions of plate of plate boundaries, and these are still colony subduction. And, and then a lot of the other uh, places are quasi stationary, so they don't tend to uh, be retreating or advancing a lot. And then there's very few places where there's an advancing uh, uh, places that you could see an advance in the in the subduction zone, and and you see a lot of uh, compression in the overriding plate that's associated with that. But these things, they they're they have a velocity and they're moving over time and they are evolving in their curvature over time. Um, also the trench curvature here is not correlated at all with the with how the, uh, the the radius of the slabs curvature is at depth. And so overall we see small small um, subduction zones in the Mediterranean and in Scotia and other places that are you know on the order of two to six hundred uh, kilometers in width and lateral extent and then we see some very large um, wide systems such as this um, Asunda trench and along the coast of South America so these so they range in in length quite uh, considerably okay so I just wanted to present these observations of subduction zones in a kind of a fun context uh, comparing to this classic analogy that was Propose or, you know the sphericity and sort of ping pong ball analogy, um, but the key thing is that each subduction zone is is an individual, um, and it has a lot of a long trench variation and its curvature, its dip angle, um, and it evolves over time. It's not a static feature, and these are actually because they're dynamic features, they're arising from slab mantle interaction. Okay, so that's where we need to look to try to find the real explanation. So um, now I'm going to go into this uh, more of a conceptual level of, uh, you know, trying to address, uh, find an approach to the problem. And we'll start off with this uh, classic, you know, paper, again, the Forsyth Ueda work. And uh, it's trying to describe plate tectonics as a force balance between driving forces and resisting forces. And so in the driving forces there's slab pull, so this uh, weight of the slab is pulling on the trailing plate. And then there's ridge push, um, it's the gravitational potential energy of this material sliding off the topographic high at the um, mid-ocean ridges. And then there's, uh, not in here, but there's also this slab suction force that, that's from the lower mantle, and we'll discuss that briefly uh, just in the next slides. And then resisting forces are just the where the, um, what parts of the system are resisting the motion. So, for example, you could have drag force here, and notice that in this case, um, the mantle is acting to drive the plates through some kind of um, flow this way, so the arrow is pointing towards the direction of plate motion and there's uh, trench suction and, and, uh, and other things. So yeah, I just wanted to point out that in this case the basal tractions are helping to drive the plate motion this is given by this uh, direction of the arrow and I think this is really where uh, the, the thinking has been for a long time is that the, I call it the bottom-up perspective and that there's an active mantle that's driving uh, plate motion and um, a large scale circulation of the mantle is helping to drive the plates above it. And so this sort of the prevailing view has been looked at and with um, various approaches and um, one that's sort of been championed for a long time is, is to try to represent uh, density anomalies in the, in the mantle such as we could surmise from um, seismic tomography, those are subducted plates and they're sinking so they're driving a flow and so this is this induced flow and this is our um, you know our sinking slab that's that's falling and it uh, this induced flow helps to drive uh, plates on the surface together into a convergence and uh, this generates uh, downwellings 
And so what's interesting here is that uh, I'm showing you some work by uh, Conrad and Lithgow Bertoloni. This, this large-scale circulation, it actually does a good job in, in some ways to uh, explain the motions and the pattern of motions on the surface. So here's the observed velocities for the present-day plate motions. And the red is the high velocities of the Pacific plate that we're both sitting on, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in the corner on the edge, and you're in the middle there. So uh, it's showing the directions and the magnitude of the velocities. And the key thing is that the ratio of the plates that are moving, which are these connected to subducting slabs, compared to the velocities of the plates that are not connected to subducting slabs, there's about a factor of four difference. So the ones that are connected to subducting slabs are moving a lot faster in general. That's dominated by the uh, Pacific Plate and the Indo-Australian Plate. Um, so if you were to only include the um, features of subducted slabs in the, in the um, a deep interior that were driving flow, you'd get a pattern that looks like this and, and roughly symmetric motions between the upper man between uh, subducting plates and non-subducting plates. And so that, that symmetry needs to be broken and the idea is, to break that symmetry is that the slab pull is um, a major driver because you actually need a, a stress guide to help the sinking slab preferentially pull the slab that it's attached to and, and that we knew about slab pull of forces for, um, you know, since they were first plate tectonics first described, and in, in this model, just the way that it's formulated, they uh, weren't able to include it in a real sophisticated way, but they, they, got, they captured the essence of how a uh, slab pull would work and added it along the line of uh, forces, and so now you see with this upper mantle slab pull, it, it reproduces a lot of the uh, salient features of the pattern and uh, uh, magnitudes of the plate motions. And so this is a you know, kind of a success for the bottom-up driven systems. Um, one, one thing that's noted by a lot of people is that uh, these systems tend to overestimate dynamic topography, um, sometimes by um, more than a kilometer. And uh, the bottom-up sort of perspective has been, you know, it won't show, but there's been a lot of other work that follows this uh, by different groups, and they try to drive plates with this uh, subducting with, sorry, with convecting, by the convecting mantle underneath. All right, let's, so let's revisit this old um, uh, Forsyth Ueda, and in this case, um, we could consider this top-down perspective and the plates being uh, only pulled by the slabs that they're attached to, and they're over, being pulled over a passive upper mantle. So in this case, the mantle is not driving the plates, but the plates are driving themselves the mantle sits there passively, and now it's acting as a resisting force instead of a driving force. It's actually a drag force here along the base of the plates. And, and this, so this is the uh, approach that um, we've been developing in the past uh, six or so years, a number of groups, and I'll sh just highlight a few results of, of this work, some of which um, is by me and, and the other people that have been working on that. And so what you need actually is the, uh, a coupled system where the subducting plate is interacting with the um, a mantle that surrounds it. And in three dimensions, it's critical that you have that so that these edges of the slabs that we saw, that because slabs have a finite lateral extent, um, it induces, as these slabs sink, it induces a toroidal flow around it. And we think the slabs deform in response to that toroidal flow, so it's critical to be able to include that toroidal flow. And uh, actually, if you have a very um, uh, a narrow slab across the edge, then it's going to significantly reduce that classic corner flow that we, we know about, um, and so which is really driven by pressure gradients. So this is going to allow these pressures to escape around the edge, and, and so that corner flow will die down. So, and this curvature then is, is explained by arising from uh, the deformation that's um, in the slab as a response to the induced flow in the mantle. So we need to have this coupled system. And uh, so this is sort of a model setup, and in this case it's uh, 
sort of a fish tank with um, a plate that's being represented as a viscous sheet that's uh, negatively buoyant, wants to sink. And so things that we can um, measure are the speed of the plate by looking at the edge of it, how fast it moves tor towards uh, the left. And then the trench is um, not um, prescribed to, to be at any location. It's free to evolve in its shape and its location, so it tends to migrate. And uh, this arrow here is the speed of subducting, uh, the subduction velocity, so equivalent to the, uh, the sinking of the slab, and that should be equivalent to how much of the plate is disappearing from the surface. So we'll get into a little more of the kinematics. And then we'd have a simple rheology here that has a strong core, and that's critical to connect the subducting portion to the trailing plate. And that's really the, the, the chain that connects it. So it's a strong core and uh, a brittle crust and a creeping underneath. See again this toroidal flow coming from the, the, back, the back flow there. And uh, poloidal flow here is the normal corner flow. And we usually use uh, mantles that are, proc that are viscously stratified because there is a viscosity jump between the upper mantle and lower mantle. Sure, there's a few things I'm missing off here. We can measure the radius of curvature, which is also not, um, nothing's really been prescribed in these models. There are all these uh, parameters are free to um, be self-determined, and the only things we really prescribe is that the rheology here and the um, negative buoyant, the amount that the plate is negatively buoyant, and the viscosity contrast between the plate and the upper mantle. So um, we can solve these uh, these equations of motion here in the uh, conservation of mass and momentum. And this, strictly speaking, um, probably isn't right, but um, just to give you an idea of this, vis this is a viscous terms dominated by pressure, uh, bounced by pressure gradients and driven by a buoyancy. And then, uh, you know, in a simplified uh, description of the rheology that we use is there's a yield stress, which means that when stresses exceed a certain amount, which we represent, we, we think are re related to the material stre strength of the plates, then uh, the, the viscosities will be reduced, and so we use an effective viscosity. So, um, it's a really a mechanical model, and it's actually, what we've done is abstracted um, mantle convection in, into just the, the things that are driving flow, which is the cold thermal boundary layer at the surface and the lithosphere, um, which is cooled and is negatively buoyant. And, and on the time scale of these experiments, it's sinking into sort of a, a, a you know, uniformly uh, warm bath of the upper mantle. And so it's a, uh, we just need to try to relate the uh, a cold upper boundary layer into a, uh, into some kind of a stronger viscous. So there's that's the key thing is that it's colder so it's stronger and so it has a higher viscosity than the surrounding mantle and like I said there's nothing prescribed a priori in, in here except the strength of the plate and the slab buoyancy and all of these motions the trench retreat and the convergence rate plate speed all of these things are emergent uh, quantities so you know this is meant to be the first step in in, in this approach and so we've really um, simplified it a lot. Um, are a lot of assumptions here. Um, so in this case the earth is flat. Uh, we're using a 3D Cartesian mantle and um, it's, uh, so there's no, no effects of sphericity in here. And, but it is 3D and that, that's a very important point is that you know there, there's a three-dimensional geometry to allow for this corner flow um, to be diminished by the toroidal flow. And these, uh, for now, these plates subduct in, in the isolation from other plates, but there's been other scenarios. And, and the mantle is a viscosity. We're just simplifying the, the viscosity of the mantle to be Newtonian. OK, I'm going to skip, skip ahead about five years of, um, of a lot of people <laughs> publishing a lot of papers and just show you something that, that's come out recently which is the same 
uh, type of experimental setup, but done in a sphere. Okay, so we, I'll, I'll continue. Let me just go back here. I'm going to um, present a lot of results that are based on um, the Earth being a cube, but these recent results here actually agree really well with the um, this three-dimensional spherical geometry, and, and we recover a lot of the same relations and plate motions as uh, as we got in the Cartesian geometry. And so you see similar uh, geometry here with a slab sinking down in a sphere. And so yeah, it can be done in 3D spherical and also induces a, a mantle flow and this mantle flow interacts with the uh, with the subducting slab. But what's nice about this is um, this, this result, if we go back to that looking at the global pattern and magnitude of the plate motions, these models have now um, you know, been able to explain the global plate motions to the same satisfaction, the same sort of level of uh, a quantitative agreement that uh, the bottom-up driven approach was. So on the top here, this is uh, plate, so these are plate velocities in observed versus modeled ones in the red and black and um, this is before they've been renormalized. There's some mismatch in some places. And then if you were to look at um, the induced flow, they can actually be, you can run each plate itself by itself and its induced flow and, uh, and build a, a picture of the global uh, plate motions. And it turns out that in the Indian Ocean, the India Australian plate and the Pacific plate are, are interacting quite strongly, so you have to consider that uh, combination of effects, but if you do and then you um, renormalize things to their induced flow the velocities, you get a fairly good agreement with between the observed and the and the modeled slab. So these nothing more than these um, viscous sheets sinking into a, a viscous mantle. We can actually get the recover the directions and magnitudes of the plate motions for the and so this is a major success for this top down um, model. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to skip. I think these are supposed to be hidden, so I'm just going to move along here and uh, and get into these results that are primarily from the three-dimensional uh, Cartesian models, which I've been doing. So we described um, the uh, the subduction zone initially as a straight line, and I wanted to impress upon you that uh, this this uh, initial geometry of the trench evolves it as the plate the trench actually retreats. So this is um, an absolute reference frame of the trench retreating, and also developing an arcuate curvature. And so this curvature that we observe is is a snapshot of a of a dynamically evolving system with a current um, curvature that we see and we we can reconstruct uh, there's a few reconstructed uh, reconstructions available um, for Scotia and for the Mediterranean that you know there's several reconstructions out there just showing you these um, in the Caribbean these are all narrow plates in in their lateral extent and they have been retreating over time and developing more arcuate curvature in the case for the uh, for Italy here and so um, this numerical model predicts that type of behavior for narrow slabs and, and particularly for Scotia and, and uh, the Calabrian uh, trench and I have a movie here I'm going to try to play for you so this is a model of, uh, of a slab and it's uh, the, the blue is approximately where the trench is. This is a we're looking at the strain rate, and it's a log scale. So everything that's purple is essentially undeformed and not straining. And so we have a very good um, purple-looking undeformed plate at the surface, and the trench is retreating back um, up up to towards the upper part of the screen. Um, also, I just point out I'm only showing half of the model domain because there's a, a mirror symmetry at, at the midplane so we actually cut the the model in half along its midplane because there's a, a similar amount of 
uh, plate on the other side due to this mirror symmetry. So um, I, all these models are showing just half of the plate subducting into um, um, a big passive upper mantle. And there's a gray interface which is uh, showing the which is showing the uh, uh, the viscosity jump between the upper and lower mantle. So this is where we're looking at uh, top down. We're looking at the slab sinking directly uh, from the surface down into the mantle, and we can see where the the trench sort of you know the fake trench is. There's no overriding plate in in these models, so we're only concerned with the subducting slab. And everything here on the plate looks nice and undeformed. So then you see from the perspective here, it's a uh, sharp radius of curvature. And as this, so the plate motion we can watch by looking at the tail move forward. And the trench we can watch um, it retreat as it moves in this direction. And the combination of those things allow it to uh, subduct. So I'll put the, um, put my cursor up where the uh, trench is and we can watch it sort of how far it retreats over time and as it retreats it develops into a more arcuate curvature so you can see that a lot of the subduction has been accommodated by a trench retreat so we've got um, several hundreds of kilometers of trench retreat from where I left the cursor and also the plate had moved forward quite a bit and so this is really representative of how subduction works on the earth because the plate is subducting both ways. Both the, the slab is rolling back and the trench is retreating and developing into an uh, arcuate shape. And the tail of the plate is, is moving forward and, um, and we have forward advance of the plate. And, but because this system is, is more narrow and it's developed, uh, it's dominated by trench retreat, you see a flat-lying slab here. So the, the slab itself is lying flat on the interface of the lower mantle. And so this model predicts that um, places where there's been, been retreating subduction should have uh, flat-lying slabs underneath. And so you, here you see three sort of cross sections through the Japan arc. And uh, of course the Japan Sea is a giant back arc basin that developed in the last uh, 100 million years. And, and you see a corresponding um, this is tomography results here from uh, Foucault's group and you see a very well defined flat lying slab underneath where there was a retreat, a previously retreating uh, trench and so now the, the I, uh, Japan arc is, is out here um, and then you see this almost exact uh, sort of slab morphology repeated where there's been this this is it Italy here in the Calabrian subduction zone you can see um, there was a lot of rollback in towards the east here, and you see a flat-lying slab there underneath the Mediterranean. It's, it's very similar. And so um, we know that narrow slabs, um, these models can connect the deeper uh, flat-lying flat slab morphologies to a uh, re retreating trench and a slab rollback. Um, okay, so when they're a little bit wider, you see this is uh, you can see this numerical model here of uh, about 2,000 kilometers and, and the same uh, sharp curvature doesn't develop but there's more curvature developing around the edges mostly and, and kind of more linear shape in the um, middle and so uh, one, one interpretation of the Mariana arc is that it's, it's about this length and it's just been slowly uh, rotating into this position that it's at now. Um, so here we look at um, a relatively stationary Marianas arc over time and a cross section through here we see um, this is a tomography by Brian Kennett you can see uh, some kind of blobby material and uh, Van der Hilst and Sino um, had proposed a while ago that um, under a stationary trench, you get sort of slab piles. The slab piles up on the interface, and you know that's that's important to realize that this folding, um, this folded slab pile, is is happening. And in the upper, in the shallow part, I mean, you, we can see places where there's a clear hundred kilometer thick slab, 
And uh, if you have really dense uh, uh, seismic networks like in uh, Hawaii, then you can really image it well. But other places and global tomography models, you know, I think they're resolving things well enough. And you see features in the uh, um, up, upper part of the lower mantle that are 400 to 500 kilometers thick. Um, and so there's been a thickening of the slab material from 100 kilometers up here to 400 kilometers up here. And so there has to be some mechanism to develop these thicker piles of slabs. And we think that what happens is the, the slabs are piling up on top of each other and thickening at the transition zone and then kind of starting to sink in as a larger feature. So in that case, the a viscosity increase is acting as a, a low-pass filter. So I'm going to pause this and um, give a little... Uh, this is our sort of intermediate and wide slab. And we have a lot of a long trench variation here. The curvature is developing towards the edge. But what we notice is that most of the trench is quasi-stationary and most of the plate motion is, is accommodated through forward plate motion. And this is developing folded um, slab piles at the, at the interface here. You can watch these things um, develop. So, yeah, most of the plate motion is through, most of the subduction is through forward plate motion. And you see these piled features here on the boundary. And, uh, and so this we've kind of uh, suggested you get some toroidal flow near the edges to get a little bit of curvature, such as down in Patagonia and, and up here. And, and then this middle part is relatively stationary and unaffected by the toroidal motion, toroidal flow. And if you look all over the world, you'd see a lot of variation in uh, slab morphology and uh, lots of thicker piles and uh, lots of morphologies we don't understand. But these are actually the, a time-integrated history of subduction in the tomography. That's what we're seeing. And because the slab, um, the dynamics of the subduction are such that the subduction zone is migrating and moving over time, and um, so these things can become quite complicated. Yeah, so I want to just briefly go over um, the, the kin kinematics of subduction. And uh, so normally we think of a uh, classic, you know, 2D cross-section of a subducting plate and the plate's moving and subducting down this way, okay. And so this is what we call subductant plate motion. And depending on um, the overriding plate, you can have extension or shortening um, depending on the motion of the overriding plate. And I've been talking a lot about the slab rollback, and this is a very important way that subduction is accommodated as well. So in this case, you can see the the motion of the trench is, is opposite to the motion of the plate and or in some cases you could have uh, trench advance but this is pretty um, rare and and this is predominantly the way that uh, a lot of trenches have some component of trench rollback if not a sen some are completely dominated by it and then the subduction velocity is the combination of these two um, motions so the trench is moving backwards and the plate is moving forwards and the sum of those two motions gives you the a speed that plate is disappearing from the surface. So if you were to make this zero, um, then the trench, uh, the, the subduction can is only accommodated by uh, trench rollback. And if there was no trench rollback, then the subduction velocity can only be accommodated by the plate motion. Okay, and so these are the critical things to keep in mind when we go over. So. Um, some of these other uh, results. All right, I'm going to speed up. Uh, so you can look at this uh, PowerPoint and later on if you need. But this is the normal way that slab that subduction is accommodated is partly by a trench retreat, partly by um, forward plate motion. And it's actually the way that we measure this on the surface is dependent on a reference frame that we choose and. and, and we're trying to find the mantle reference frame so that we know what these values are. That turns out to be trickier said than done. Um, however, the convergence rate between the over overriding plate and subducting plate, that turns out to be a reference frame independent. So, Okay, so I described that we had uh, several segments of uh, uh, systems, and, and so we described these as widths. And we can go along the width of a particular 
so they're labeled down here, and so I'll just point at uh, Cascadia, for example. And this is a particular width, and we can average over the width what the subducting plate speed is. And so we'd look over here, and it averages about 4 centimeters a year. As we've done this for about 16 subduction zones on the planet, and it turns out that the narrower plates have less forward plate motion, and the wider plates have the most forward plate motion, the widest plates being um, the Nazca plate and out here in the Pacific. So you see those out here. And if we did the same thing and averaged along the, uh, along the subduction zone how much trench retreat there is, then you would find that the ones that are the most narrow have the highest trench retreat rates, and the ones that are the widest have the least trench retreat, but they still have some component of trench retreat, even, even in um, this, this, these very wide systems. So what's, what you could do is actually look at the um, partitioning, which is how much of the total subduction velocity, which is you know both things combined, how much of that the ratio is, is accommodated by forward plate motion. So this, um, you know, if you have one, then it means the entire plate is subducted, is all of the subductions accommodated by forward plate motion. And if you have zero, that means all of it's accommodated by trench retreat. And we actually see in Earth a clear, there's a few outliers, but overall the trend is remarkably uh, well described by um, do, doing these kinds of averages along individual subduction zones. And we see a clear relationship between the width and the subduction partitioning. And so this is what we've done with those models that I showed you. We, we ran a lot more models than the ones I showed you. And uh, these are those three panels that I've just gone over. And in the models, we see the same trends in terms of uh, the width controlling the amount of uh, how much forward plate motion there is, how much trench retreat there is. And we see a nearly identical sort of fit here. And then we're able to develop uh, based on this um, and energetics of the system, a, a fluid dynamic scaling that describes um, this system very accurately. And the, the essence here is that the upper mantle is totally passive, and the only way that these plates are driving, um, are moving, is through um, the slabs that are, that are pulling on them. So it's a slab pull, 100% slab pull dominated system and uh, it depends on the width of the slab, we can recover. Not only can we use this top-down approach to explain the pattern and magnitude of the plate motions and the directions accurately, but we can actually get the partitioning between how much of each, um, how much of the subduction velocity is partitioned between trench retreat, a slab rollback, and uh, forward plate advance. So um, we have scaling relationships to, to back this up. I won't go, go into those now. It basically depends upon um, the drag that you get from the component, uh, toroidal component as the plates get more narrow, that becomes more important. And then we're going to apply this to um, a place near and dear to my heart, which is the uh, western United States, western North America. And we'll go back to 52 million years when we had a Farallon plate that extended all the way down to South America. And, uh, and so this is a reconstruction here. You can see at this time in the overriding plate, um, we had uh, a lot of compression in this severe and laramide orogenies. And so I've highlighted that as this point here, sort of a maximum extent of the Farallon slab. It was about, it was over 12 to 14,000 kilometers in um, lateral extent. And then uh, the upper plate was in um, compression during this time, and there was most of the Velocity, most of the subduction was accommodated through forward plate motion of the Farallon slab. Okay, so all of that makes sense. And then something happened, which was the Farallon plate started to break up, and uh, this uh, was already shrinking from the south. A uh, slab window here uh, started to develop in uh, well, in Alaska, and so we, it's starting to shrink a little bit, and the plate motion is starting to slow down. So this is that um, mostly in the science paper that I had sent um, ahead last week. And then we had development of really a, um, the Farallon plate snaps here, and we, this eventually turns into the San Andreas um, transform fault. And so, but this, the point is that the slabs are disconnected now, and they have the slab to the south disconnected from the slab from the north, and there's enough toroidal flow that can we have 
go through these new developed slab edges, and so the slab uh, width has dramatically decreased. Um, and what we see is now the subdu subduction motions are favored to be in trench, uh, trench retreat. And so now we have mostly trench retreat by the Farallon and um, a lot of extension in the overriding plates driven by that trench retreat. And so this is an idea for why the basin and range developed as a consequence of the transition of um, compressional to extensional of stresses in the overriding plate and a transition from forward plate motion dominated to trench retreat dominated subduction all being driven by the lateral width of the Farallon plate. Now that's a nice story, um, so this is the present day, but um, we need to validate that a little bit better. So what we did is we took that model and we put it into a convection model with a, a, my a postdoc here, Li Jun Liu. Uh, so we have gr uh, amazing um, high resolution tomography now because of an earth scope and we can see at different depths uh, what a seismic anomalies look like underneath North America and the question is you look at this and, and you wonder where where is the Farallon slab? We don't really see it there. <laughs> Where'd it go? And we see these blue features but we don't really know, okay, is this a drip, a slab pile? Um, we don't really know and we see sort of some red spots here as those conduits. So there's a lot of open questions what these features in the tomography um, may be. Um, but it, it actually has some kind of strange um, geometry to it, and, and this geometry here, it seems robust across multiple um, tomography models. And so we've um, added this kind of concept in, and, and Li Jun has done a lot of work, um, this is actually published now, and uh, developing, um, marrying the two types of models that, that uh, uh, we've developed into a convection model. And I'll just go over this, uh, what we call the segmentation. So initially at 40 million years, we start with a um, Juan de Fuca plate and there's this uh, line here is going to show you how much the trench is retreating and it's, it's not a lot of trench retreat um, up to 20 million years ago and we have a lot of plate, uh, forward plate motion. This is showing where the stable continental craton um, is. And then starting 15 million years, we had this transition probably because, driven by the change in the slab width and we see a lot more a pronounced trench retreat over this time period and that helps to establish the present day uh, geometry so this model here at zero million years is the final time integrated history of the uh, modeled Farallon slabs uh, descent through the upper mantle and in the green we've uh, modeled what uh, kind of an averaged uh, <coughs> To sort of a qualitative average of four different tomography models of where they think these uh, slabs are and there's in all these models there's a distinct gap between um, these three green segments, there's a gap here in our model and, and a gap here and that's a robust feature in all of these tomography models so how did that gap develop? Um, I should mention by the way that these these models are incredibly robust constraint on trying to forward model the um, subduction history and um, if you looked in detail in terms of how these things develop at depth um, and our best fit model here there's this horseshoe shaped structure and these um, not only are there gaps at depth but there's gaps uh, laterally as well and so you see gaps here and these features these individual segments curl into little horseshoes and that's followed by by this horseshoe shape here and that's that's amazing because we got um, let me just go forward a little bit. This little horseshoe shape that we see in tomography, this is our model uh, slab and it corresponds amazingly well with the location. So we think we can explain this little horse horseshoe shape drip is simply um, the segmentation of the Farallon slab as it sinks and breaks apart. And this indicates to us these slabs are pretty weak and that's what we've been saying for a long uh, time now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So best fit model, you notice that these little gaps occurred and one of them occurred at a particular time and I'll just give a quick overview of the pattern of volcanism here in the western U.S. which is um, you know eastward trending towards Yellowstone through the Snake River Plain but this westward propagating high lava plains 
that's uh, going towards Newberry. But this outline here is where the um, Columbia River basalt was and proposed, you know, maybe it's a mantle plume head, maybe it's some back arc basin related to back arc volcanism. And then in more detail, um, we actually see the time progression of volcanism within this Columbia River basalt as starting at these Steens dikes here is the initial point and then propagating towards the north and then simultaneously propagating towards the south along these um, feeder dikes here to the main uh, voluminous outputs of Chief Joseph here, the Imnahan Grand Ronde uh, units of that are the most voluminous and that's the largest eruptions and then there are more limited down here but there is a clear um, trend in the North Nevada Rift. And so you can see that um, progression of volcanism in these slides. It happened between 16.6 uh, initially in Steens then shifted towards the north in the Grand Ronde where these very voluminous um, outpourings occurred and basically over, fifth, over one million years um, a lot of the Columbia River basalts were erupted. So it's a very short time, that's why it's a uh, proposed as sort of a you know, <clears throat> large igneous province and we looked in more detail in our models at, at this time between 18 and 15 million years when this first a segment is breaking and uh, this is um, you know, written more, I'm sorry this should be 2012 now, it's published in um, Nature a few about a month or so ago and this is um, a zoom in of the hinge area where it actually shows some advective erosion, uh, thermally advected erosion through the hinge of the slab and then finally uh, disconnected here and so we wanted to look at well what does that look like in terms of the uh, comparison comparing to the uh, observations and so this is a three-dimensional view of, of the Farallon slab and we have uh, circled here this little uh, gap and projected this um, gap on the surface so that's this pink area here and uh, and out here, this is the, the ridge and the other uh, Pacific Plate going that way. And the initial eruption at the Steens Mountains was uh, located here exactly at 16.6 million years. So, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Steens, that should be moved down here. I think that's a mistake in where I put that. Um, so this is the, where the trench was at that time and, and the slab edge at 70 million years. And um, Steens Mountain, actually not shown <laughs> the slide got a little goofed up but it should be spot on so the the first tear is exactly coincident with where the Steens mountains are in space and time and our model 17 million years at Steens at 16.6 million years and then we see this progressive uh, rupture propagating across the hinge which is uh, laterally going north and south as we saw in um, moving towards the Chief Joseph uh, dikes and these major feeder, feeder dikes up here at the Idaho border and then along the south to the um, progressing south as well to Nevada and um, then you see a little more trench retreat and this whole this tear is really opened up in size and so at this point it's very large and we see the largest eruptions happening at this time through the Chief Joseph Dykes form and then finally um, the volcanism starts to wane down around uh, 15 million years to show a snapshot here of a the whole at 10 million years but essentially it made this kind of pattern that um, really um, once this hole is big enough the the pressure to drive flow through this hole has is gone because it's really just um, equilibrated between the behind the, the sub slab pressure and the overriding um, mantle wedge pressure okay so we've proposed this is a new way to in, in uh, develop a large igneous province and uh, the model forward predicts the spatial temporal pattern really well of the uh, Steens Columbia River basalt volcanism. Uh, if you read more details of the paper, um, it's consistent with a lot of geology, and, and of course, we base this model on its agreement, its very nice agreement, seismic tomography. So, this is sort of the up projected onto the surface, the development of this ruptured slab, which um, is even better validation that we are indeed modeling tectonic plates because we can now forward predict what um, events have occurred geologically in space and time. And so it's my uh, conclusions here the Earth's not a ping pong ball and these stresses of sphericity are really unimportant because what's what's dominating the system is the interaction between the mantle and the slab and the induced flow in the, in the of this toroidal flow deforming the slab and creating that trench curvature. That's 
actually the dominant effect for why we have curvature. The slabs are very weak. Um, they fold, they pile, they curl, they tear open. Uh, they're easily deformed by the mantle flow. The basin and range is probably um, developed because of this transition from plate advance to rollback, which we think is caused by uh, the uh, serendipitous development of the um, San Andreas Fault and that slab window, and the classic Tanya Atwater paper. And then finally, um, we're able to forward predict this uh, Columbia River basalt um, volcanism by uh, having a propagated rupture of the Farallon slab that we see in the um, numerical models. So that, I'm sorry I ran over, but um, I think that's most of what I w wanted to show.